Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, the Arts Business Model Canvas with Tara Van Amarongen. My name is Laura and I've had the pleasure of working with Tara recently and it's so great to be able to share her knowledge and expertise with you today. I would like to start by warmly acknowledging the traditional custodians um, and owners of countries throughout Australia, including where you are today. I myself come to you from Gadigal land in the Eora Nation and I pay my deep respect to Elders past, present and future. If you would like, please share an acknowledgement of the country you are joining us from with us today in the chat. Currently on screen is a blue PowerPoint holding slide with text and video boxes with our guest speaker and Auslan interpreter Shavoy. I am a woman in my mid thirties. I have fair skin, dark hair. I'm wearing a greeny shirt today and I'm sitting in front of a painting in my house in Marrickville. Welcome to Creative Connections, everyone. In a minute, I will introduce you to Tara, um, who is our excellent guest speaker for today, um, to talk about the arts business model canvas as a tool for artists and organizations. Today's session, like each session, has been designed to support you to provide resources, practical tools and insight from experts on a range of topics, including digital leadership and practice adaptation. We hope these sessions have been useful as we recover from the challenges of COVID-19 and take a moment to reimagine our futures collectively. I'm particularly excited for today's session with Tara as the tools and thinking she will share is so practical and so useful to how organisations can consider or reconsider their purpose and their operating model for a more sustainable future. Some of you may recognise Tara, she is the lead facilitator for our new program Futureform, which is designed to support organisations transform and reimagine their business models. I'll come back to this more in a second, but before I do, I'd just like to go through some of the housekeeping and features of today's webinar. Firstly, closed captioning is available. Um, you, if it's not on already, you can turn it on by pressing the CC button at the bottom of the screen. Um, we will be running a chat throughout today's session, so feel free to share anything in the chat feature, links, resources, ideas. Um, Francis will be managing the chat and you can access it by pressing the chat button at the bottom of your screen. We'll also be hosting a Q&A with Tara at the end of um, the session. So if you have a question for Tara, please add it into the Q&A tab again at the bottom of the screen and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, we will be recording today's session like we do with each session and the recording will be available on our website in the next few days. If you're having any tech issues or something isn't working, you can use the raised hand feature again at the bottom of the screen and Kevin from our team will be in touch to help you sort it out. Okay, so it's no coincidence that Tara joins us today. We have been working with Tara and Afters for the past 12 months developing Futureform. As I said, Futureform is a six month program for organizations to reimagine and transform their business models. The program creates time and space under the guidance of experts and coaches for organisations to really interrogate and reimagine how their business model can serve a more sustainable future. Applications for future form are currently open and they actually close next Friday, the 26th of June. Um, future forms open to small to medium organisations from across Australia working in um, any art form. I strongly encourage you to have a look at our website for more details and consider applying if this is of interest to you. If you have any questions about the program or the application process, you can send us an email at leadershipprogram at australiacouncil.gov.au. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Tara. Currently on screen is a PowerPoint slide um, with a portrait photo of Tara. Um, she's a fair skinned woman with short brown hair, wearing a red top, smiling at the camera. Tara has a wealth of knowledge and experience as a design and innovation leader. She is the managing director of Us Too and is the entrepreneurship and innovation practice lead at the UTS Business School. And she works alongside afters to help um, arts organisations with this kind of thinking. Today, Tara will introduce the Arts Business Model Canvas. 
It is a tool to strategically and logically examine, explore and rethink the core components of your product, service or offering. It is both simple and complex and challenges to really unpack what and why we are doing what we do and, how, and asks us how we might do it better or differently. Tara seamlessly makes complex business innovation accessible and achievable, removing the fear and intimidation that many of us feel with financial strategies. She shows us the value of clear, practical and informed thinking that challenges our assumptions and encourages new approaches to enable long, longer term viability and sustainability. I honestly think this should be a must see for all arts organisations in Australia. Thanks so much for joining us, Tara, um, and giving us some insight into this um, Canvas tool today. Um, I'll let you take it from here, and I think you've got some slides to share. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, while I'm just getting up my slides, um, I want to thank everyone for joining, and um, here we go. There we go. Um, and as a reminder, we are speaking about the arts business model canvas. So this session is particularly relevant today because we are navigating uncertain times. Um, many of you are pivoting your organizations as a matter of survival and we've been thrown into a situation where we need to reinvent ourselves from the inside out and really define what it means to deliver value to the world and really adapt. And the session's really about looking into a framework that's widely used in business. Uh, the business model canvas is a tool that defines how you bring an offer to the world. And today we are going to be looking at a specific application on how it applies to the arts sector. So it's the arts business model canvas. And we'll talk today about how it can be used for strategy, for design, for redesigning, or just even checking in where you're at. So I'll be spending about the next 35 minutes explaining the model in more detail. And then we're going to look at how we can come up with some new ideas or explore patterns and really just think a bit differently about you and your organization. So what about you? Today's my opportunity for you and your organization to explore alternatives, to think about innovation, um, to maybe look a little bit differently on how you see the world, maybe get inspired, help you try out an idea you've been had in, in the backlog for a while. Or maybe you're already an expert on this and you just want to sharpen your knowledge. In any case, welcome to you all. And there's a lot of cover to cover today, so settle in. One last thing before we start, I want to give a warm welcome to those with access needs. As previously introduced, uh, my name is Tara Van Amarongen. Um, there's been a description of, of what I look like. The only difference today is that I'm wearing a lilac purple sweater. And today I'm also working from home. I'm actually working from nursery from my seven month old. So uh, in the background, there's yellow and gray balloons on the wall. There's a crib next to me and there's a bookshelf in the background. As we continue through the presentation today, I'll also do my best to make sure I describe any of the diagrams that are being presented. So let's get started then. So we wanna start first with some definitions. Uh, a business model canvas really describes the rationale of how an organization creates, delivers, and captures value. Uh, a business model can be described with nine basic building blocks and the traditional uh, business this model canvas is something you can see on the screen with these nine blocks. They include your customer segments, your value proposition for each segment, the channels you might use to reach your customers, the relationships you have with your customers, um, also uh, the revenue streams that you're generating, resources, activities required to create value, partners you have, and then of course the costs you have of your business. So it's not enough to know these elements. What you want to do is you want to put them on a canvas structure. And that's what we call the business model canvas. So on the screen um, is a diagram of these various blocks fitting together on a page. And it's a tool that helps you map, discuss, design a new business model. It's anywhere from startups all the way up to the most senior of executives. The business model canvas has become the standard for how people map out aspects of the organization. But if we want to switch to the arts sector, the question arises, is this really applicable? Is it still fit for purpose? So I really wanted to call out how they're different and how the new model we'll be talking about today addresses these. So arts organizations are different because they're not always commercially driven or not as commercially driven. They're often also an extension of the artists themselves. Your identity is being put out there into the world in terms of product or service. 
there's also an artist buyer relationship that's usually a direct one it's not via um, an intermediary or, or many different channels um, also the revenue channels often support the making of art they're not where revenue directly comes from in many cases and lastly the artist authenticity is central and i love this point it's really about being true to who you are as an artist even when you're in a commercial environment So Michelle Carter from the Queensland University of Technology, she wrote her master's thesis on reimagining re -imagining the business model campus, and she did it for the visual arts specifically, and this was made in 2018. And she mapped out the business activities of seven different Australian visual artists um, against the original business model canvas. And her research revealed a number of inefficiencies in applying this model to the art space. And so she made a new version, the Creative Business Model Canvas. And it gives artists a tool that's really tailored specifically for them. And even though it's been developed in her thesis for visual arts, it really does apply to the arts in general. Uh, in, in general. So on screen, we can see a canvas diagram with not nine blocks as the original canvas I just showed you, but it has 11 blocks. And a key difference is the modification of the value proposition, which is central to your canvas and your business. And this is broken out into artistic identity, art products and art services. And what we're going to do today is we're going to step through each of these blocks to detail how they describe various aspects of your organization um, and also how we can use them to come up with new ideas. So the first we're going to start off with, which is right in the center, which is artistic identity. Artistic identity describes, in essence, who you are as an artist. It's something that's not likely to change. It's your ability, your approach, your talent, and how you articulate your craft. It could be redirected, repackaged, pulled apart and put back together, but essentially it's everlasting. It's something that is part of you. An artist value proposition is partially intangible. Artwork is a, a really complex commodity and your life story, authenticity, dimensions of your work um, all become references for how people evaluate the quality and value of your, your work. Um, and that artistic identity block captures those details. So we wanna know about your artist's life, their work, the motivation for creating art. Um, and if you wanna think about how would I populate this, you can ask yourself the questions there uh, on the screen, which are, who are you as an artist? What's your work about? What are your professional achievements? And why do you want to make art? This makes you ask, what is uh, artistic identity? And to expand, we want to use what's called the life and work model, both of who you are and what you do. And that definition of an artist's artistic identity has three dimensions, your personal story, your work, and authenticity. And that authenticity is being really true to oneself, meaning that your work should be aligned with both your personal and your professional motivations. And when this was researched for that thesis project in Queensland, many artists express kind of ambivalence about being involved in commissioned work, saying that that satisfaction of it, the freedom and their own intrinsic motivation all made the decision quite complicated to participate in those. The impact of the artist's identity and authenticity um, has, is, is quite significant in this space as it guides all the activities that an artist might undertake. Um, and all the different elements. So that's why it's really at the center of the canvas because it is so critical. Um, also, it's really important that artistic identity is quite clear um, and we articulate it really well thinking about these different uh, questions and aspect of it because it's so central to the model and it will impact all the other parts of, of your business. Um, artists are also conceptualized as human brands and they use their artistic identity to contribute to their brand and could potentially also increase the, the value of their work. So this is very interesting. And one of the quotes there says that um, when people buy a piece of art, they buy the story. They also buy into your life as an artist. So it's this, this notion of buying a piece of an artist that um, an artist and the objects they create are, are just surrogates of, uh, of who they are. We're going to move on now to describe a few other aspects of the canvas. So let's, let's look at art products and services. Uh, and this is what is produced or offered to your buyers or your audience. So products could be the product itself, uh, any spin-off products, related services, and also the customer's experience. And services are what you provide in a more intangible form. So describe the difference. Um, a service might be a guided tour through MoMA in Manhattan. 
but a product might be a print of an art piece that you can purchase at the MoMA Design Store online. So it's an adjacent uh, offering to the physical viewing at the museum. And uh, the artistic entity identity block previously described that it was uh, intangible and there was underlying value provided by the artist. And here we're describing the basic product lines and services that, that are provided. So you could also say it's what a price is attached to. So when you go to fill this out, you would describe all the physical aspects, um, such as the medium you use, the size of the artifacts you create, the genres, the styles, and the subject matter of your work. So for those who have joined, who are already familiar with the traditional business model canvas, uh, these two blocks, products and services and identity together, replicate what was the value proposition block. Next up is communication. So this describes how you engage, interact, and communicate to your audience or your buyers. Um, to fill it in, you could ask those key questions. How do you communicate with your audience? How does your audience know who you are? And also, how do you reach them? So think about how you communicate to a customer. Is it um, an Instagram follower, an art buyer, commercial client, um, someone direct? You can ask yourself, how am I doing it today? How could I mix this up? And also, what other ways could I get in touch with my audience that I haven't thought about today? The next block is your audience. So in the traditional business model canvas, this was your customer. And these are all the people or organizations you're creating value for. So it includes paying and non-paying customers. For each segment of your audience, you'll have a specific value proposition. And those are bundles of products and services you create for them. So, in a market-driven business, um, a business would tailor products and services to the customer, but we know this is quite different for artists. Many artists are, have customers that are families and friends, and they're not regarded as customers in a commercial capacity, um, but we often find we use the word uh, customer as well. Um, but some artists also don't like that because it goes against that authenticity and motivation for, for creating work. Some research uh, has shown that um, you can identify part of your audience as an artist quite often as a champion of your work or an advocate. And these could be people who've purchased your work or people who haven't, but are just really supportive of your career as an artist. Um, there's also nonprofit supporters uh, that act like brand ambassadors. They help you recruit new audience and they advocate for sales on your behalf. So when you're thinking about who your audience is, make sure you don't leave them out. So questions to figure out who your audience are. Um, who are the people who like your work? come to shows, uh, they might follow you on social media channels, who are the people who actually buy your work, and also uh, who are the people who pay for your services. And on that last one, it really hints to those commercial clients who might buy your work for others to enjoy. Next up, we want you to think about the channels to use. So those are those touch points where you interact with your customers and you deliver value. So it could be physical channels, digital, it could be an art gallery, a retail store, a personal website, an exhibition, an Instagram feed. Um, it can even be the street corner that you're busking on. So if you wanna think about those questions of what are your channels, you could think about where do you sell your art? Uh, where does your audience find out about your product? Uh, who helps your audience make decisions about buying it? So who are those influencers? Could those be a channel? Um, who actually does the sale? Uh, who does delivery and installment of, of your work potentially? Um, are there any services after they've also purchased your work? So those are all channels to really be thinking about. It's really important to answer these questions to have a clear picture of your audience's purchase experience, to really understand how you can manage your brand while remaining true to your own motivation for being an artist. Uh, one finding from the research into channels show that artists often offer a level of dedicated personal assistance when selling their work. And they do this to communicate to their audience and share their identity as an artist without actively trying to sell it. Um, and the main driver for many people to have a channel was to show the world who they were and then sort of tack on selling their work as something secondary. And many artists noted um, that this commercial motivation really conflicted with their personal motivation for, for making art. So um, take heart if you've experienced this, you're definitely not alone. But if this is you, how do you feel about adding that commercial side to your portfolio? Um, by keeping the focus on the work, but showing people how they can see more, how they can have it in their home, um, or how they can share it with others might be a more natural way to be able to generate revenue from your work. Next up is a simple one, 
revenue streams. You'll note, interestingly, we didn't start with this. Many people think of business model and they immediately jump to revenue, but we first wanted to understand what's the value you're delivering? Who wants it? How do they want it? And then you make clear, you know, how are you going to, to charge, uh, you know, what's the economic model sitting behind what you do? What's the pricing mechanism um, to capture value? So some of the questions you can ask yourself um, are, what are the ways you gain income from your art practice? Uh, how do you determine the sale price for your art? And also, what are the ways that you earn income outside of your arts practice? Um, this last one is an interesting one. Um, many people do earn income outside of their practice. Um, so as an example, say you delivered a workshop next to your traditional arts practice. And it's important to include this income. Um, it's really important uh, to see the whole picture of you as an artist or your organization when you're populating the canvas to really understand all the different ways that revenue is generated. We're now going to describe some of the operational sides of the canvas. So first we talked about how is value created? What does that look like? Uh, you know, who's interested in it? How do we charge money for it? Now we're talking about the operational side. How do we actually make this happen? So the next one we wanted to describe was key resources and partners. So this is really about what infrastructure do you need to create, capture and deliver value? The key resources block shows which assets are absolutely indispensable to your business model. And key partners are those people who can help you really leverage your business model since you won't have all those key resources yourself. So if we take an example of uh, you are a digital recording studio, you might partner with someone who's able to lease equipment to you, or you might have a provider that licenses software that you need in order to be able to do that yourself use resources yourself and you also might partner with other organizations um, the other thing that's important to think about is to record any unpaid support um, that contributes to your business model here so you might have resources and partners that you don't pay for but you should still record them to really again get that clear picture um, of what's needed in order to make your organization or your, your practice continue the next one is pretty straightforward, key activities. Um, these are really just the, the absolute summary things you need to do to perform well. So uh, think about you know, making the artwork, um, the administration behind it, and um, developing your artistic identity. It should be a short list, you know, three to five items. Um, so an example of um, activities for making artwork could include uh, generating ideas, researching them, uh, sketching, drafting, uh, painting, publishing, that list goes on and on. And for administration, it could be uh, planning exhibitions, um, competition entries, uh, bookkeeping tasks, organizing the delivery and installation of work or any other logistics. Usually these are the tasks that uh, most people enjoy a bit less as an artist. Um, and lastly, the one about developing artistic identity. This could be things like writing or curating exhibitions. Um, it could be attending events, responding to call outs and being involved in um, other arts organizations that help the, the sector. So those are those key activities that uh, you undertake as part of being an artist. So let's turn to your business. How would you describe what those key questions are for you? So what's the process you use when creating your art products? Um, what activities do you do? And also how do you develop your artistic identity? We want you to be populating these and really thinking um, about what are the things you do and whether those activities later you can challenge. Uh, are there different activities you should be busy with? Are there things on there that are gaps, for example? So um, keep jotting those uh, and thinking about those as we go through the different blocks. And finally, what does it all cost? Once you understand your business model infrastructure, you also have an idea of its cost. And the aim here is to describe all the costs involved in running a business or a practice, and it helps you identify what are called cost drivers. So a business can be either cost-driven or value-driven, meaning um, you could be charging a price that's either based on what it costs to make something, or if it's value-driven, you could be um, seeing what the buyer is willing to pay and that could be much higher than what it actually uh, costs to create it. So if it's cost driven, you're often um, charging a price of cost plus a bit of extra margin. And if it's value driven, you're really putting out there what you think the, the market will, uh, will pay for your work. 
So some of the questions you can ask yourself to identify what your cost structure is are what are the resources and the activities that cost you money? Um, what are the um, activities that you also might receive at no cost? So you want to include them there anyways. Um, if, for example, you get free support and that falls away and all of a sudden you have to pay for it, it's good to really take account of, of what that is. When answering that first question, um, artists should really think of uh, fixed and variable costs. So if there's studio rent, painting supplies, um, and also if there's any costs with exhibiting, for example. Uh, the second uh, question there regarding um, what you receive at no extra cost. Um, one thing could be um, examples of delivery um, from, from friends or family, um, specialized art supplies you might receive, um, anything that could basically impact any of your profitability in the future we want to include in the cost structure. So that's it. Those are all the blocks. We, we did a whirlwind tour through them to describe what they are and how they might apply to you or your organization. And with this tool as the canvas, you can map out your entire business model on one page. So to summarize at the heart of it, in the center of the canvas is your artistic identity. And this remains true because it represents who you are in your work and your life. And it really has to remain authentic. That's key. The right side of the canvas and those blocks really describe how do you bring your craft, your offer into the world, how do you articulate who your audience is, how they might want to be reached, how they want to interact with you and your organization, and really what it is you've packaged up to offer them. And all of that drives the revenue model at the bottom, which is what they're willing to pay for the value that you bring. The left hand side of the canvas was all about the operational side. So what do you do to bring your offer to the world? What products do you create and what what resources do you need and what partners do you need to help you and all of that really drives the cost structure that's at the bottom so when the canvas is fully populated it helps you answer three key questions that really govern any organization and that is does anyone want this thing is it desirable are they willing to pay for it is it viable and can you execute your idea um, or for, for an artwork or for a, a product and can it be delivered? Is it actually something feasible for you to bring to the world? The answer has to be yes to all three of these questions for an organization or a business to be sustainable. And that is universal across startup, corporate, um, you know, financially viable artistic organizations as well. So you can see that the canvas is really trying to tackle all three of these elements um, and make sure the answer is yes to all three of those of those questions. So at the heart, does anyone want this? Is anyone willing to pay for it? And also, can we execute on it? So now that we've kind of done an introduction to the canvas, um, what's really interesting is to delve into how can we use this to really think differently? So once we've plotted out what is our current state, what does our organization or offer and our artistic practice look like? How can we use it to come up with new ideas, but also to work out through any new ideas. So first of all, let's talk about generating ideas. If you went through your existing model block by block, have you looked at are there ways to approach it differently? When we were talking through it, did you think about a different channel you could be using? Did you think about a resource that you might not be exploiting enough? Did you think about a, a partnership that perhaps you could um, also amplify? Did you think about other ways you could offer your service or your product or your works um, you know, to a different audience segment? So um, that is one way to really just focus block by block and go through your, um, your current business model and think differently about, are there possibilities here for us to do something different? The other way in which many people use um, this type of canvas is to plot out new ideas. So quite often, uh, we have been working in our, in our space for a long time, we know it very well, and we've always have some ideas on the back burner. And we may not have the funds or the resources or the, the energy to go and try them out. So the canvas can be used to plot out new ideas. So you may not have tested it, but if you take that idea and you plot it out on the canvas, you can think about, are there any gaps? Um, how would we actually make it work? 
how would we actually charge for this? Would it align with our identity? A lot of questions will come to the, the fore, um, but also there will be some things you don't know the answer to, and you will have to make some assumptions. And so one of the questions is, what are the riskiest assumptions you, you've made to populate this canvas with your new idea? And how would you have to test those out to know whether this is something you would want to move forward with? The other thing is what impact does that idea you have have on the other elements of the canvas. So if you wanted to reach out to a new audience, for example, what impact would that have on your key activities? Um, if you wanted to include a new partner, would that change your cost model? So it's really good in plotting out an idea and seeing what the repercussions would be before you're in real life, just trying it out on paper to see whether an idea really has legs and, and to think about it from different perspectives. The other way that uh, using the business, this, this, this arts business model canvas is really compelling is you can explore what are called patterns. So there are business model patterns that many organizations, um, you can see that there are different ways and, and uh, similar ways that they go about their business models. And I thought this was um, helpful to talk about how most artists, um, what pattern they use in their business model, and also introduce a few additional patterns that might also get you to think about how you might want to shift what uh, what you're doing. So most artists use today what's called the long tail. And this is a pattern that focuses on a single offering uh, with a large number of niche products and there's a strong platform, which is your brand. Um, so if you wanted to think about how this could be done differently with new possibilities, we wanted to look through some other alternatives. So rather than having a single offering, uh, and, and offering a large number of that offers to as a niche product, um, you could look at unbundling business models, for example. So if your business model is really driven by, um, is you can clarify whether it's about products, is it about customer relationships, or is it about um, infrastructure? Um, what is it? And could you separate those out? And those become sort of their own departments or entities or spin-offs to your traditional business. Um, also, you could look at multi-sided platforms. So there's buyer-seller relationships between audience and artist um, or uh, a developer and a consumer. And if you have a multi-sided platform, you are basically just managing a platform. So a really great example is Spotify. All they do is they look at building that platform and they connect artists and listeners. They don't create the music, all they do is play the intermediary role. So that's one pattern that another company is using. And you could ask yourself, could I become a platform where I actually just connect to two sides of a market? Another one of these patterns is uh, free as a business model, so or freemium. So what you could do is uh, you have one segment of the audience who receives the offer for free and then others who pay for it. So could you offer a portion of your product or service for free? And then another part of your segment, uh, your audience segment also, you know, do you do earn revenue from them? So if we keep with that Spotify example, um, most of us have the free version, but there's also customers who pay for a premium version because they don't want to hear the ads. And the revenue generated from those premium um, members is basically paying for the service for all of us. Um, and it's great because then there's, you know, continuous revenue for, for Spotify for the entire group of audience members. The last pattern that's interesting is an open business model. So um, how do you commercialize ideas from others and bring them in? Or how do you allow others to commercialize your ideas or products? Um, this is a really interesting one. I think the, the not-for-profit Creative Commons is a really good example of how do you foster that flexibility for IP rights or give the public permission to share and use your creative work. Um, why it works is that there, you know, there's an ability to amplify economic benefits using digital technology. So um, that business model is really trying to make sure that artwork is, is spread wider and further, um, expecting economic benefits to, to trickle in from that. So these are just food for thought. These are some patterns other than just creating uh, the same offer um, and having that direct model to your customers where you could think differently about how would I operate in the, in the arts sector. Another way you could think about using the business model canvas is to think differently about how your business is oriented. So this is um, a bit of a, a brain stretch. So um, there's four, four different ways here we wanted to talk about how you could think about your business orientation. So 
First of all, resource driven. So if one of your uh, core assets is infrastructure or a partnership, how could you use it in a different way? So a simple example would be if you have a physical space. This is an asset that might be used um, by day for one purpose and maybe it could be used at nighttime for another purpose. So you're really taking that resource and you're deciding how you could use it in different ways or, or pivot your business model to use it in a different way. So in today's climate, you might be losing foot traffic for um, a retail storefront. Um, you could think about converting that and renting out the space for, for a studio space for those who might need it um, to get away from working from home, for example. That's one way you could pivot your business model to be resource driven. Um, the next one is offer driven. So this is one many people think about. How do I just create a brand new offer? Um, it's pretty straightforward. Many people are already doing this. Um, we also see because of COVID um, and people moving digitally, we see this definitely happening already, taking live performance online, um, people pivoting to um, viewing, to giving classes, webinars, and tutorials rather than physical visits. Um, the next one is audience driven. Um, this is really finding what people want how they want it, when they want it, um, and it's, it's giving, getting feedback to understand how you can adapt what you offer. I think this is probably the most powerful way to think about your, your business model and how you adapt. So when I advise companies on how they can remain relevant in the market, I always remind them that if they're absolutely obsessed about what their customers, or in this case, your audience, want, and you keep listening to them and adapt how you serve them, you don't have to worry about what the competition is doing. Um, because you understand and adapt to what people are looking for. So a simple example um, of this could be that screen content has moved into an on-demand model. So rather than broadcasting or viewing times that are set, your audience has moved to a different platform. And if you're audience driven, you move with them to provide content to where their eyes are going. The last one here is finance driven. So uh, this is thinking about new revenue streams or pricing or uh, reducing costs. Um, I would say price theory is an art in itself. You know, how do we strike that balance between maximizing what people are willing to pay for and you know, valuing something and not leaving any money on the table. So um, experimenting this and finding out what people value or willing to pay uh, might give you some ideas. Um, I've personally observed a few trends with my clients. Um, the first one in a, in a finance driven model, um, people are thinking about loyalty programs. So people want to be valued for returning to you time and time again. Uh, it creates stickiness, it reduces customer churn, and it opens up many different ways to uh, reward loyal customers um, other than just price discounts. Um, the second trend that I've observed is the emergence of that subscription model. So as payments tick along in the background, Customers don't often reassess the price uh, that you're charging. It's almost hidden and you really benefit from that ongoing and predictable revenue coming in. And lastly there, I put in uh, the multi, multiple epicenter driven. Uh, that's a mouthful. Basically that just says you could do a combination of these all at once if you're really ambitious as well. So you could look at uh, changing orientations in a couple of different ways if you wanted to really pivot your organization. So that's a lot of theory in there. I thought, let's think about a real practical example just to bring it to life. Um, so I took the example of what would it be like if you were to plot out some different ideas and different ways you could change the business model for book publishing. So if you were to start with a blank canvas and you wanted to fill in all the blocks, you could see how it would work in, in practice. So on the screen, I'm showing uh, several canvases which have been filled out, um, each with uh, ideas on how to change book publishing in the way it's done. There's, of course, a traditional model to do this, um, but you could offer uh, a few different um, other ideas on how to do this. You could offer a co-created book where others collaborate for the content. You could offer a book for free um, for a marketing space in it, much like how magazines and newspaper work. Uh, you could publish a book on demand, either as people request it, um, or you could wait until a certain threshold of people have expressed interest and then move it forward to publishing. You could also offer a book um, and extend this into an online experience. Um, and even for those who would want to flex their creative muscles, uh, you could create a DIY book and that would be quite different as well. Um, and you could have sponsorship um, and customized books as well. So those are all um, the A and B of, of you're going to publish and uh, and an audience member or a consumer or a reader getting the book is the same, but how you do that and the model you would use in order to bring that to life is different in all of those different cases. So to understand if any of those ideas had legs, 
the canvas was used to plot out the idea. So by filling out who would buy this offer, you know, who would those, those readership, who, who would they be? What channels would you use? How much would you charge? What are the resources, the partners you would need? How, how much would it all cost? Very quickly, you can see the implications of the model and, and what you would need to support that idea. It would raise questions. It would give you clarity and, and really push your thinking on how you would bring it out into reality rather than leaving it on paper. But it's a fantastic start to really think about all the different aspects of you trying to, to bring this idea out into the world. So in summary today, um, the Arts Business Model Canvas, we went through the different blocks and we, we went through a few different ways how you can use the canvas to look at your business or to come up with new ideas. Um, and what this model does is helps you identify those key drivers of the business. So what are those key activities, the key things to driving cost, uh, driving value in your business. Um, also helps you spot some opportunities for um, innovation or change, particularly if you go block by block through the canvas. Um, the canvas can also help you map out how an idea would work. I think this is one of the most common uses of such a canvas that when you have an idea and you really want to find out uh, if it will work, um, just write it up on paper. It could take half an hour with you and your team. Um, and also, you can see how you can change the orientation of your business. You might have some key assets. Um, you might have some different ways you can, you can price yourself on the market um, by just following some of those, those patterns and orientations and just giving it a go to think about how you might want to, to change your organization. So if you want to know more, um, please Google Future Forum from Australia Council. You'll find there that program as uh, Laura mentioned called Future Form, and that program runs from September to 2021. And that's all about exactly this guiding your organization to transform its business model. So if you jump onto the Australia Council website, you can learn more. And keep in mind that the applications close on the 26th of June, which is next Friday. Um, but for now, we'll turn the mic over to you guys for questions. Thanks, Tara. Thanks so much. What a great presentation. It's so useful to see all of the um, the components of the model out there and then and how we can kind of challenge it and move forward. So thanks so much for sharing it so clearly. Um, that was really excellent. We've already had a bunch of questions come through, but if you have a question for um, Tara, please add it into the Q&A box and we'll do our best um, to get to as many as we can. If you're okay, I'm just going to dive right in and get started. Um, the first one um, is from Anya, who is just asking for some clarification. Um, communication refers to the ways in which you talk to your audiences about your art, while channels refers to the way that audiences actually access your art. Is that, is that a correct understanding? Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. So maybe I'll use an example um, to clarify it. So uh, imagine you're going to have an exhibition. Um, and you use the, uh, you want to communicate to people uh, via Instagram um, uh, about that and let them know as a, as a communication channel about you and the exhibition coming up. But the actual channel that um, they're going to experience your product or service is, is the exhibition itself. So uh, the channel is how your products or services are delivered and experienced by the audience member and communication might take other forms. So a communication um, uh, way of communication for many of us is, email, social media, um, this, this webinar, for example. Um, sometimes they are the same, but sometimes there is a distinction that you um, may not communicate to, to people. You, you often have more communication channels, um, sorry, more communication methods than the actual channels you deliver your work through. Um, so that's the distinction we want to make there. Um, I think when you find when you plot them onto the canvas, um, it'll become clear where there's any separation for, for you as an artist. I would say it, it can be confusing because quite often they're, they're similar for most people. Great. Thank you for clearing that up. Um, we've also had a couple of questions that are kind of in the same vein about how mm. we can map or include some of the social outcomes in the business model um, framework that you have presented. And um, yeah, because a lot of arts organisations also deliver on some of these social outcomes. Yeah, and I think in the, um, uh, if you think about sort of the um, businesses have come onto this theory of, you know, triple bottom line about social, environmental and governance, as well as a business. Um, and if we just think holistically about why an artist is in the world, um, 
we're enriching the, the life, you know, lives of people in society. So making sure that you account for that on the canvas um, is important. So the artistic identity and those services and products should include, you know, those elements that are part of that value proposition. We know that um, we may not be able to charge for them. Uh, you know, there may not be a, a particularly a cost for them, but we need to represent them on the canvas as well. If it's one of the reasons why you do what you do, I would say put it on the canvas. It's really important because if you're going block by block and thinking about how you might make a change here and how it will impact others, you wanna make sure it's on there because if you change your partners, but it actually would impact a social outcome, or you're thinking about a new audience and all of a sudden, you know, it might also impact one of those, uh, you know, have some of those impacts, you wanna make sure you account for it. So while in the traditional sense, it doesn't equate to dollars and cents, it has value. And that's why in the presentation, we use the word value a lot. It's bringing value to people and to organizations and to your audience members. So um, fight for it and make sure it's on the canvas. Great. Thank you. And another question about the canvas that's just come in from Paul. Um, where, where should the expectations of stakeholders um, be included in the model? So if that's mm. government or sponsors or donors, where does that fit in? Yeah, I think um, that's a really good one. So when I looked at the adaptation for this, I think the misgivings of the traditional business model canvas as well as this one, it really talks about uh, the traditional business model canvas talks about customer segments, which are just people who pay for your product or service. This canvas just talks about audience, again, who sort of consume what it is you put out there in the world. Um, I've always put in sort of uh, stakeholders next to the audience or the customer segments because they do matter. Um, you know, they may not be a partner or somebody pays for your work, but they have a huge impact on on what you do and you do have to care about you know how they're involved um, and um, what what impact or influence they could have if you made changes um, to your business model so both this model I kept it true to how Michelle uh, developed her thesis and also how Osterwalder and Pinot wrote the original business model canvas my hack for that is making sure I list those um, next to the, the audience um, just so that you've got them in the periphery in the view as you start to play around with the different areas of the canvas. Um, but uh, if if the person who made that comment wants to take another go at the canvas um, and expand it, uh, you can put a little copyright on it and, and launch it in the next webinar. <laughs> Thanks, Tara. Uh, we're running out of time, so I might just do one more question if that's okay. Um, there is a question here that's come through and I know that it's a question for lots of artists, but how do you account for your time in the business model mm -hmm. canvas? Because if you do so, then your costs dramatically go up. Um, and what's the kind of balance or relationship between those two things? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, the, the canvas um, isn't to evaluate you and how you spend your your time it's it's for yourself to really provide a view of reality um and in doing so you might see you know if you for example uh realize you spend a huge amount of time on say it's you know um aftercare once you say say there's you know art that you deliver and there's a lot of things after the fact that you're dealing with if you represent that on the canvas one of your ideas might be maybe i should partner with someone to do that for me because basically you've, you've, um, you've highlighted that there's uh, something there that there's room for innovation on or adjustment or a pivot or to try something new. So my suggestion would be fill in a canvas exactly how things are today and go from there. You wanna see reality. This isn't a way of evaluating yourself. Um, we wanna know what you do that's paid, what's unpaid, put everything out there that you do as an artist on the canvas, because all of that is just reality and you wanna see it and make it visible for yourself to start thinking about how you could do things, things differently. Um, and I mean, to that comment as well, I think take heart, most of the people who were involved in the research for putting today this canvas, do what they do because they love what they do and they try to make it work financially as, you know, as a, as a, as a side point to it. So, um, yeah, the, the primary reason for, for people usually going into the artistic fields um, isn't, you know, because it's financially viable, but I want you for, yeah, this purpose to put it all up there and see, is there a way that you could make some of those shifts um, or sometimes to just provide that mirror to say, well, this is what I am actually spending my time on. 
Totally. Thanks so much, Shara. And I think that's what the value of the, the model is to just see it all out on paper and then know what you're working with. So thanks so much again for sharing it with us and for taking us through it in such a kind of detailed way. And I recommend everybody to have a, have a go at, at um, applying this to their, to their work. And if this is of interest to you particularly um, and you're ready for change and you want to transform, I encourage you to have a look at our website and um, find out more about future form. Um, as I said, the applications close next Friday, so not very long to go. Um, Tara, thanks so much for, again, for joining us and, and for that presentation. It was really excellent. Before we leave, I'll just um, give you an update on what is happening in Creative Connections next week. We've got a session on Friday um, about all things legal and going digital with Elliot Bledsoe. Um, that's at 11 a.m. And then next Wednesday, we have a session with Patrick Moriarty from our community who is going to talk about arts governance which is super important at the moment um, and then next Friday uh, the 26th of June is marketing for artists and organizations with Monica Davidson from Creative Plus Business so a whole bunch of sessions that are coming up that are on a range of topics um, and hopefully uh, um, of interest and useful to you so if you haven't already you can register for those sessions um, on our website um, and as I said, this session has been recorded. So if there's anything that you missed or you want to go back over or you need to hear um, Tara explain it to you again, um, it will be published on our website in the next few days. So thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I hope, yeah, you got as much out of that as I did. Thanks so much Tara for, for presenting it to us. Um, thanks so much Catherine and Shavoy um, for being with us today and we'll see you all next time.